Welcome to Genuine Humans, exploring the stories behind the great marketing leaders of our time and hearing how their journeys have influenced the brands they've built. Brought to you by The Social Element, here are our hosts, Tamara Littleton, CEO and founder, and Wendy Christie, Chief People Officer. Welcome back to Genuine Humans podcast. Wendy, how are you doing? It's lovely to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm doing really well. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing very well. And I'm particularly excited, so excited about the guests that we have on because this is a bit of a first. We actually have two podcast guests together, the wonderful David and Madeline McQueen. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Yeah, I want to go, yay! <laughs> we do that. Right. We're making history, yes. Mm. We are making history. And I feel like everyone knows who you are, but I'm going to just sort of say, because it's actually quite difficult to sort of pin you down because you are executive coaches, you are amazing keynote speakers. I got to see you both speaking together in person at uh, the most recent Marketing Academy Scholars Training. And I was just blown away. But how do you describe yourselves? So I describe myself as an executive coach, a soft skills trainer and a speaker and sometime host. They're the things that I tend to do. And what I do is I, I all of my work is based on three words, clarity, confidence and empowerment. And in there is strategy and all of those sorts of things. But it's about getting really clear about who you are, where you want to go, what you want to do. So, you know, building evidence-based confidence, and then using those two to be empowered. And then once you've got all of that, you can thrive ultimately. So that's what I I talk about. In there is leadership and self-development and and professional development, but that's where, that is the core of everything that I do. I'm the co-founder of Q Squared Limited with my wife. Oh yeah, I never say that, ever. (laughs) Yeah, that's fine. You did yours, I did mine. I'm the co-founder of Q Squared Limited. Oh, hold on, one more thing. And I'm also the founder of... The Compass Club, uh, which is a club exclusively for women in the world of work who are emerging or or actual leaders. And it's really a safe space for them to grow, to explore themselves, to find their direction and to be the best that they can be. But also to find that find tribe. It's difficult to grow when obviously maybe you're the only one or maybe you're at a particular level and there is nobody to have that conversation with. I'm the co-founder of Q Squared Limited. <laughs> You're just going to go with that. <laughs> similar, similar to Madeline, speaking, coaching, facilitation around leadership and culture. Those are the main things I do. But you also updated your LinkedIn recently. Yes, compassionate provocateur. I love that. I love that. <laughs> I'm going to hold my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go back because you both have your own careers, but... You, you have co-founded your company and you have been doing keynotes together. How has that been? And could I also actually just get you to go back and say, how did you actually meet in the first place? Can I, can I go there? Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. 100%. Do you want my version? Let me go with my version of the story. Yeah, then first. I can do the corrections. Yes. <laughs> so we met many years ago, 34 years ago to be exact. She was actually dating a young man who I knew. We used to play mm-hmm. basketball together. That's when we first met. And we met at a concert in Milton Keynes. It was Take Six, uh, 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 gospel stroke jazz acapella. sextet, because there's six of them. Yeah, yeah acapella group. So we met there. Um, very brief. I waved at her, quickly shook her hand, and then kept it moving. And then we met in the May, May or June later of that year at a church event in Lordship Lane in North London. Okay, fill in the gaps. You really tried hard, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was expecting, I am the co-founder of this, <laughs> of this relationship. <laughs> Actually, there's a really interesting story because, uh, yeah, we, we met like in 1988. It's so long ago. It just, it's crazy. Um, this is yesterday. And uh, we met at an event. And it's so interesting because I had just broken up with somebody that David knew. And we just got talking mm-hmm. and it was so interesting because we didn't actually end up talking to anybody else because we were just chatting yeah. and it was just like, oh, this is really 
comfortable and easy. And then I, uh, you know, so we'd see each other. And, and then, um, so I'm originally from Leicester. And uh, I'd come down to London for this event. And I think it'd been a few days. Yeah, after a few days, he called me and he said, um, so, you know, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Da, 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 and I'd like to have a relation with you. Now, I was an English literature and English language student. And I was like, what the arse are you talking about? It's <laughs> it is relationship. Um, okay. He okay. likes to say, go on, so, go on, say it. This is a little... So this is important. This is quite prophetic. We have two daughters. <laughs> so I was being intentional. We now have two relations. So I <laughs> my plan was uh, <laughs> prophetic with foresight. Screw the English language. I knew where I was going. Yeah, okay? so we... <laughs> We dated, you know, like, obviously I was, we were young as well, you know, I was in Leicester, he was in London, we, we grew up, money. yeah, we grew up as very strict Seventh-day Adventists as well, both of our families, so, which is obviously one of the reasons why we met, um, because it was a church event, so, you know, for four years we were having this long distance relationship, and I think I used all of my inheritance to um, travel to London, and uh, and then I you know and then I moved and to London and I think I was here for maybe about three years before we got married, and yeah you know our relationship had its its ups and downs as relationships do. One of the best things that we ever did was have marriage counselling before we got married. Oh wow! I definitely recommend it for all couples yeah. because there's so many things that you don't have conversations about. Oh my god! That you just keep kind of brushing under the carpet and it all came out which was really useful first two uh, sessions we didn't actually speak to each other other afterwards afterwards. afterwards. like drop me home i will not goodbye goodbye nice to seeing you we're getting married there's no nice to see you (laughs) (laughs) so yeah and then i was had moved to london and you know it kind of all went from there we both had separate careers so david don't go to the careers yet, because that's coming. Let's talk about the yeah, relation. Yeah, but they did actually Let's talk ask, about the relation they first. They did actually ask about... Let me just talk about the relation. <laughs> it's all connected. It's all connected. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. So I I got a job um, as a financial advisor. It's a crazy, crazy world. Uh, David actually ended up being an accountant. I was for eight years. And I, I came out as the ideal salesperson, So because I took a psychometric test. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up in sales as a financial advisor I'd actually gone for a customer service job and yeah from there ended up in IT sales selling IT to corporates meaning corporate account manager then running a team you had a different track didn't you yeah, I um, and then I left work because I had a mass miscarriage and it was I was yeah, talk about the baby first the first child you had oh yeah I had a child um <laughs> I had a child <laughs> and actually it's really interesting working with a child in a pretty male dominated space. Not that there weren't women, it's just that the leadership was very male and also just the the decisions and also I was a really strict Seventh day Adventist sense. And so many decisions were made in the pub that I never went to. So being Seventh day Adventist is very similar. It's it's a Protestant branch and it's it came around the same time as Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, so in the mid nineteenth century. But they the alignment of Seventh day Adventists is very similar to Ju- the Jewish religion. So we have we observe a Sabbath. So from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, we, we were quite strict about observing that. So what that meant is restricted a lot of the opportunities we could get because we were out of the office. You know, everybody, if they went out on a Friday, we weren't there. We would literally be going home or getting ready for church or worshipping or what have you. And we didn't drink. We didn't drink. Didn't smoke. And we, we don't smoke anyway. But, yeah. um, you know, and, and so... <laughs> That's all changed now, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so mine was slightly different. I went and I did a degree in law for a year, hated it. Uh, left, um, wanted to do something in uh, what they call the migrant four. Um, So what that means is usually if you're coming from a Caribbean or African background, they expect you to either be in law, medicine, engineering, or what's the fourth? Accountancy. Or finance, yeah. So I went for the finance route. Didn't really want to be an accountant. Hated, like I have an aversion to exams, but literally did everything up until my last job I had, I was like an assistant finance Manage, yeah, assistant to the finance manager, but I didn't want to be an accountant because as much as I loved understanding about money, the nerdy side of it was really... And when I tell people I'm an accountant, they usually laugh at me. They go, no way. And I go, yeah, I was <laughs> uh, But then I moved out of that because I loved, I love systems. I like that logical side of doing stuff. And I moved into IT. So it was a lot more systems, doing a lot more systems reporting and financial reporting, helping people to build systems. And I went into project management. And then around the time, I think in our early 30s, 
I, I decided to kind of like branch out on my own uh, and do my thing. Had had a very expensive lesson that time, um, but then came back and I really loved doing the personal development stuff. I loved doing careers. I loved teaching people presentations. I loved working with young people. And basically, we set up um, some companies and um, my co-founder here, basically just came alongside me because she was like you're crap at the admin you just got <laughs> processes yeah, we don't get paid you just you know, we're not like, getting paid on time where, where's the invoice where's the invoice <laughs> big picture's great but we need the detail oh why are you charging them? so i said all right you know what you be my fire to my ice and we'll do it from there yeah i think also because i came from a sales background and obviously it's very sales is still the very I want to say system attached, um, but you know, there are lots of systems and, and processes around that. And then also, you know, being in sales as well, it was about the, you know, making sure that you were bringing in those numbers, having the client conversations, understanding how important those emails are and, you know, and how to, like, I have a, I'm a bit of a stickler about emails just because often this is the, the written word. I learned this very young. The written word is open to interpretation and so how you write it is going to make a really big difference. And also, you never know what side of the bed somebody may have got up on. So you need to always make it as as uh, encouraging as possible. Whereas Dave's like, yeah, I'm coming. And that's the email. See you. Bye. And I'm like, OK, that's not. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. I'll be there tomorrow. Um, and it's like, OK, um, I think maybe we need a little bit more no, what's the, finesse. Why do we need hello that? and um, signatures? Anyway, moving on. So for me, you know, I was, I was selling at you know, my team were bringing it. And bear in mind, this is like the year of our Lord, 2000, you know, 2001, you know, 14 million is what we're responsible for. And, you know, I even on on my own, you know, I I sold the most Toshiba laptops in the country. I sold um, the, you know, I had one of the biggest contracts that our organization actually had uh, with a company called Schlumberger and a massive oil company, well, massive in oil and, and gas. And so, it's really interesting because you do these things. We don't even you're co- it's not always cognizant about them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I left as well, it was because I left because I said I can't do this anymore. I was being bullied. Um, I lost, you know, I had a miscarriage. I had a child already, and I said I'm not doing this again. And we had a great, a absolutely great doctor when I had that miscarriage, who was just like, you know, he was, I remember he was chewing, it's chewing gum, it's yeah, chewing gum. It was just like, Gosh. well, you know, you you know, it's bad, sad, but you're good for pregnancy so go again okay. you know and you know you've got other people go you know you've got to wait three months and it was like and he was like no go again and so I got pregnant that's how we got our youngest daughter Lauren so Rihanna and Lauren are, are our girls and can I just pause on that a second while we're doing that um whenever we share the story of the doctor sometimes we look back on it and we think oh my gosh it was it's so incredulous that this guy was here chewing gum we're mortified we've just lost a child or whatever he's chewing gum and he's like you're young it's fine you can get on loads of people have miscarriages more people have more miscarriages than they have pregnancies. just go on and have sex and you'll be fine and i think we walked out of there laughing in shock because we were like mm-hmm. what the hell just happened um, but then it was quite true it was that you know very often the conversation around Pregnancy often misses out that a lot of miscarriages happen a lot, mm-hmm. a lot more than we realised. Uh, but what we decided to do, especially when Madden had Lauren, is that it wasn't going to be stressful for her to have to be bullied and be under that kind of pressure anymore. And so we would find a way to work together. And, and let's be honest, at this point, it's bloody hard working together as a couple. Mm. If you don't know what your lane is. Right, but that's a question that's worth I'm asking just putting it later. out. I'm don't, just putting it don't out. Don't jump the gun. <laughs> no, no, you <laughs> can go wherever you want. I'm, I must admit, I'm still kind of got the picture of that doctor chewing gum. It just seems so disrespectful that I, I love that you've gone, took it as a positive eventually, and, and maybe it, it, you know, you, you reframed it, but um, I, I still can't quite get that picture out of my head. 100%. When we, when I, sometimes when I talk to people about it, they were like, what, really? And I and it's an interesting point because I think for us, whilst we were in that moment kind of like going, oh, my God, what just happened? This is just like, you know, we were expecting the second child and it all went, you know, to, it all went south. Him doing that, we literally walked out of there with nervous laughter, just laughing like, oh, my God, can you just believe what happened? And, mm. oh, my God, this is true. And it was... To your point, for anybody else, it might have been, what the hell just happened? But for us, it was almost like a valve for us to laugh and a valve for us to release and just be able to go, do you know what? This is can be really overwhelming. 
and this caricature of a doctor has actually just made us laugh and and we go on to the next. But again, as you said, you reflect on it, you go, wow, did that actually happen? But I think for us, we took it as a, okay, this is not the end of the world. I think also for me, uh, certainly for me, I mean, it was a doctor that I'd had for a while. Yeah. And so I kind of knew his style. So I wasn't offended by it. And then whilst other people might go, this is terrible. Actually, it was just, it was so sad. Mm. It was so hard and difficult to go through miscarriage that actually it was really quite refreshing for somebody to say, it's okay. This is mm. part of life. Mm. Go for it. You know, you, you're you geared. It's not now spend the next three months depressed. It's... Mm-hmm. Like, no, get back on the horse, no. almost. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the wrong... What? <laughs> I'm a horse? <laughs> <laughs> Children listening to this podcast, please close your ears. Okay. <laughs> it is a saying. But you know, yeah, and, and yeah. that was actually really refreshing. Like, go for it. And actually, through that whole process, for me, that's when I learned miscarriage is really, really common. I we may be having them and not even knowing that they're happening. Oh, you know, my period's a bit late, and then my period comes. Actually, that might have been a miscarriage. And so mm-hmm. it was just really fascinating as to how just how these things that happen that we don't talk about that we don't yeah. uh, there's a whole issue about women's bodies and 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 the the fact that there are so many things that we go through like I'm menopausal my goodness somebody why didn't anyone tell me that at the end of 30 years of periods or however long it's been you know that there's just a nightmare waiting for you I mean it's, it's, it's like, rubbish isn't it it's, it's like why was there not more warning <laughs> there's no warning can I, can I add one last bit to this as well the, the other thing that I realized as well is that because of my experience I'd say around the year or so that it happened we knew about three or four friends in our wider network who also suffered miscarriages and one of the conversations that I realized wasn't happening is for a lot of us as men in those situations, specifically, we had to hold our grief so that we could let the mums grieve and, and, mm. and our wives and partners grieve and being in that space. And what I found was being able to share the story of the chewing doctor for a lot of men allowed us to create space in that moment to grieve as well, to see that the one of the things about humor for me as well is that it 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 makes us realize how how fragile and silly life is. So that's what humor is, right? Mm-hmm. It's the kind of like that, that dark side of us sometimes that we, will, we won't really want to pick up and actually address. And being able to do that, it I got to speak to it. I got to speak. I'd speak about it. I I, I used to go and speak about it in schools. I used mm-hmm. to speak about it in business. And I would say, because I would say to students, for example, look, life is really tough. Let me give you some examples of some stuff that's happened to me. Lost my business, lost my house, lost a child. And kids and students would be sitting at me like, well, what? And I'll go, I'll tell you the story of what happened because this is what happens in real life. Mm. And, you know, sometimes it would be, you, you look across the assembly room of 300 kids and you could see they were close to tears because I was being so raw about that. But I was really just trying to say to them, this is part and parcel of the journey. And again, in business. So you bring it back round and you realize sometimes these lessons, um, not for everybody, but sometimes these lessons are there to teach you how you cope in that situation. What does resilience look like? What does, and it informs the way that we work as well. Mm. And good to build it from that early age as well for kids. You know, the fact that you're sort of sharing these stories, as you say, it's real life. Yeah. And one thing I will say about my own career, because I didn't just become David's admin assistant, is that's that's so <laughs> but is that, you know, in leaving, and I think, again, another thing for a lot of women is like, I'm now out of, I'm not in the workplace. How do I define myself? I don't have that title mm-hmm. anymore. What does that mean? And I'm, I'm behind. I'm not catching up. But you know, uh, because everything's moved on without me and I'm with these children, not realising we're gaining a different set of skills. And so for me, it was just, I started doing little things like business consulting and sales consulting and, you know, I started coaching. I took a coaching course and, you know, and and just finding myself called to do things, doing consulting, working with business owners and recognising, and that's how I got to where I, what I do now, which is just really recognising sometimes we're working on the business, but actually if the business owner 
doesn't feel confident, doesn't have clarity, doesn't feel empowered. It seeps into the success of the organisation. And so, and that's how I pivoted from working on kind of the business side to the person side. Um, and confidence has always been a thread for me. So, um, so yeah, and so we, we've had a number of rodeos when it comes to business, but this is the one that I think aligns with both of us mm-hmm. the most. Yeah. And, you know, that is about helping people to see what's possible for them um, and also to step into what we would call their magnificence. I love that. And also the freedom that you still can do your own thing, but then collaborate as and when you want. Yeah. Yeah. That that feels like that's quite an important part of it as well. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And it is a, it's... We are warts and all. Well, you saw, you saw, you saw yeah. us. So, so you know, we're quite warts and all. And 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 one of the things I I really believe in in when we do share the stage and when we do work together is getting people to understand what that balance actually looks like. And that mm-hmm. sometimes we don't get it right. And and you know, one of the the one of the things that really has jumped out when when we are working together is sometimes we'll go into a room or go into spaces, and people will often defer to me. And I'll go, no, you need to talk to her. She's the boss. And sometimes you can see the shock on people's face, like, whoa, 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 what? And I go, no, she's the boss. You go and ask her. She's the she's got all the answers. He's a soft touch. All right. That's yes. why the fiery nice. Yes. <laughs> she talks about the emails, right? And like, she says, Madeline will talk about the emails, but Madeline McQueen is the one who will go and burn down buildings, defeat territories, and <laughs> what have you. Whereas I'm like, okay, all right. Are you okay? All right. <laughs> a little sound on that. It's all right. But it is, but it is, it's, it's to your point, it's, it really is around how do we get to show up and how do we get yeah. to demonstrate without giving away too much, right? Because we, we will share personals and we, we select the bits that we are, yeah. are personal about, but we also think those ones are really important for people to recognize all this hype and blue la and everything about, oh, everybody be happy at work. Like, that's crap. That's just not how it works. Let's talk about when it does work really well, but also let's talk about when it, when it goes tits up. Oh, obviously, I know that Wendy wasn't there and I had the experience of, of seeing the scholars learning from the two of you. And, and it is super powerful because I think, you know, the, the leaders of tomorrow, the um, marketing directors who, you know, on track, you know, maybe for like CMO level, all of this does need to be trained because we're not the finished article. We are works in progress. I've picked that up from yes, you. Yes, yes. <laughs> and. and I sort of speak to other people and everyone is obsessed about, you know, having a personal brand and how do you do this? How do you do that? And, and there's so much sense that we, we are supposed to know everything. And of course mm. we don't. So I think it's, it's great seeing that coaching being given to, to our future leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think one of the things that as you get older, and we're still like, we feel like 18. Um, but it's, it's also recognizing that as you get older, you realize how little, you know, and that's okay. Like there's so much mm-hmm. more to learn. So there's so much more. Uh, it's it's bigger than you ever thought it was. And so when you take the pressure off, like I start a lot of my workshops, go, my name's not Google. Like, and even Google doesn't have all the answers. Your name's not Google. And so this expectation that we should know everything is unrealistic. And if you, in, in, in order to know everything, you'd never experience anybody else because you'd just always be trying to learn everything. So. Um, I think the sooner that, you know, people on the leadership track recognise, I don't have to know everything. But what's important is to be able to tap into people who have pieces of the pie. That's going to make the biggest difference. Do you mind if we go back even before you met and before the relation, yeah. etc.? So you met when you were 18 and it sounds like you discovered there was, you know, an element of your backgrounds that you had yeah. in common. But I expect there was lots that you didn't as well. And I'd love to hear about your how you each expi- experienced childhood and how that might have influenced where you are today. So I'd love to hear what you were like as kids. So, okay, so I'll go. So as I said, I'm from the Midlands, from Leicester. My parents are uh, or were from the Caribbean. So my mum from Barbados, my dad from Antigua. I'm the youngest of six girls. Wow. Yeah, so for me... And, and they used to call us the Amazons. And my dad had this thing, like, if if somebody hit you or put their hand on you, um, he was like, you have hands, right? That was his thing for us. So we were never to be 
taken advantage of. Yeah, I was going to say dainty, but um, <laughs> and not, not that we couldn't be. My mum, my mum also was, you know, she was very well dressed, which meant that we were all very well dressed, always colour coordinated, uh, which is ingrained within me. As a child, they used to say of me that I'd been down here before. Um, I, I think I've always been a little bit of an old soul, and I've always been cheeky. I've always asked questions yeah. and I've always said things that people are like oh my god she said that so I remember that and I think also being the youngest of six girls I know this for sure is always fighting to be heard because you have to you're you, yeah. there's so many other people um and also pre- being the inverted commas baby also again like I'm not a baby um <laughs> a grown ass woman so there's there's always that but you know we were always doing a something, you know, really quite creative. And I was just say, I was saying, you know, we used to do dances to things like Ladies Night and create them and I have really vivid memories. And my older sister went off to, um, to do nursing. And although she was still in Leicester, but she was in halls and the rest of us, the five of us, and we used to sing this, We Are The Chambers Five to um, one of the Enid Blyton Yes. famous five yeah. uh tune so yeah and, and we had a whole dance to go with it and stuff and so childhood was fun um and we used to often go to victoria park it was a big part in the middle of leicester um and play cricket with my dad and my mum. and my mum, my parents were very young people focused we used to have a party every year and my mum made her dresses and she used to look glamorous and glorious and she also as i said she it was always about us being well dressed well put together and colour coordinated, like that will never change in my life about being colour coordinated and pressing your clothes and that kind of thing. Um, but when I was 10, uh, I came home from school and uh, my dad had had two strokes. And then um, oh, no. and then that night he was rushed off to hospital and he died. And that was <laughs> like completely world rocking. My mum was mm-hmm. kind of, and also I think that was the day I had to become an adult um, because there's also supporting my mum who was now, you know, lost her, you know, her her life mate and now had six children between the ages of 10 and 20 to be responsible for. And I think a lot, a lot of that has ch- definitely shaped my life. Um, growing up Seventh-day Adventist too, like one of the things that we've always encouraged to do, you know, it, it had its challenges and its issues for sure, the never good enough stuff, but also the being on stage singing presenting you know or that was our upbringings which is why it's never been a problem for us to stand in front of a mic because we were doing that since Jesus was a boy literally um so you know so the, for me that's kind of what it was and you know we used to have Caribbean nights where we'd you know learn so much more about the culture so yeah so that was my upbringing and, you know, going to school, went to Abington and Guthalaxon College. We had purple blazer with a, um, a tiger emblem tiger, yeah, on, uh, in gold on our blazers. And we were just so proud because we had purple velvet blazers. It was just like, yeah, so that's, that was me. Okay. I, I was born in St. Mary's Hospital, Paddington. Oh, you really went back. All right. <laughs> the, the hospital I was born in, Leicester, is also called St. Mary's. It oh. doesn't exist anymore. Oh, really? It's freaky. Okay, so we were both born in St. Mary's Hospital, okay, in different regions. Uh, what year? Uh, in the year of our Lord, 1969. 1969? We're both and same when, year? Actually, the month you were born, what happened? The month I was born, I have an affinity with with Neil Armstrong, because I was born on the 19th of July, and they were, they were in the sky then. Um, <laughs> that's my claim. <laughs> <laughs> They did it on your birthday. It was a celebration. She does love a full moon. She kind of yeah, like... but they are moon and sun and, you know, water. They're my things. Okay, for clarity, she doesn't howl. I'm just making sure that everybody knows that. <laughs> so mine now, okay, born in St. Mary's Hospital, Paddington. My mum is from Barbados, so both of my mothers are from Barbados. And my dad is from Grenada. And they actually, ironically, they actually landed in England on the same day. But my dad came by boat and landed in Southampton. And my mum flew from Barbados. But although my mum left, you know, a lot uh, shorter than my dad, they both landed in England the same day. Grew up in North West London, in Halsden, for the first 10 years of my life. Uh, and then we moved to Harrow. Interesting story about that, actually. So my dad was always very particular about the way we spoke. And we were just talking about speaking and presenting. We used to have this thing in church. It was called 13 Sabbath. So basically four mm-hmm. times in the year, 
you'd literally, as a young person, you'd have to get up, you'd have to recite, recite passages of scripture, sing mm -hmm. a song, play some music, do a little bit of drama. Be a play, in a play, something. yeah. So any one of those four, so performance was drummed into you from there. There was no such thing as stage fright. You had <laughs> And also you were doing but it from very, very young, very right? Young, from very you know, young. If you had stage fright, you concealed it very well and probably in your 30s then had therapy about what actually happened <laughs> at that time. But you were really confident about doing that. And the other thing which really stood out for us and a part of our experience as well, which is really interesting when we've, when we've done work in youth work and, and even in, in the corporate spaces is that we know nothing different than growing up in what was an upwardly middle-class Caribbean community. We were surrounded by doctors and lawyers and bankers and mm. nurses, entrepreneurs, even for the word, we knew the word. That stuff was part of what we actually had. Ironically, and we didn't realize this until we actually slightly later on, I think either when we got married or when we were dating, Madeline's dad and my dad actually met on a cricket pitch I think. I was believe so. Something years, yeah. years before, and also so even when, before we had met. Because they were both activists as well. Yes. So that within the church yeah. to actually have allow kind of black representation, representation yeah. in the leadership. Yeah. So, and there was like yeah. get togethers and caucuses and that kind of stuff. And so we never realized, and I think it wasn't, even, it, I think it was well after we were married that we yeah. realized that our parents had actually, actually had, met. Our, our fathers had actually hmm. met. So it was, in, it was in the stars. Or in the moon. Anyway, so um, so essentially, we we were surrounded by those individuals. And I said I grew up so I grew up originally in in Harlesden, and I I actually remember it was a predominantly black school that I went to. But a lot of my friends used to say, "You speak so posh. Why do you speak so posh?" And my dad would really like he'd give us grammar lessons. Like I do this thing on LinkedIn called Word of the Day. It's still a throwback because I love improving my language, and I believe language is power. But a lot of my friends they used to call me coconut. So basically, they used to say the way I spoke, I was black on the outside and white on the inside, all right? That was a phrase, okay? And then I moved to Harrow, which was predominantly white, and I was one of a few black people, and they used to call me Bourneville. So I gave myself the moniker of the chocolate boy wonder, because between the bounty and the Bourneville, I thought I'm going to be able to take this and um, to use it to myself. And, and, I, and I say this phrase because I realized that a lot of the stuff that we went through when we were younger, how I managed and how I coped in a lot of situations was with humor. Mm. So... Mm -hmm. You know, growing up in 1970s Britain, there was a lot of racism, right? You, 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 it was, it was, there was no subtlety, right? It was very express. Mm -hmm. And there were times where my method of surviving was to be funny. I, I had to be funny because for me, otherwise than that, I'd just get, my, my madam will tell you, I had a really bad temper. And so I'd get angry. My deflection was around humour. And, and a lot of Caribbean folklore and community, a lot of it is around humour. A lot of it is around how you, you manage in those situations. Mm -hmm. And so again, you know, we were involved in both of us um, sung. So we sung in church, we used to do choirs, and we would both act, we would both speak. Um, we both lead we, singing. We, would lead. we were both in sports teams. We used to have this thing as well, where the coach trips were a big thing, right? The Caribbean community to go to Blackpool. I mean, I look back at it now, like, why the hell did we get up in the morning from yeah. London, stupid o'clock in the morning to drive, only to the only point to go to Blackpool, let's get it right, yeah. was to see the lights. Why have we left? Even from Blackpool Leicester, you know, we there. went to the Lake District yeah. for a day. I think yeah. we spent maybe four hours. Right. But the thing was the about trip. the coach train. Oh my gosh, that's all the, all the, I mean, we took the train one year. Oh, really? Yeah, we all caught the train uh, as a church mm. and went to the Lake District. Yeah. Like, it was, it was mad. And actually, it's so funny because we were always wondering who would miss it. Like, because the, the, you know, like there was always somebody who was going to be late, and it was so funny. We remember the train was pulling off, and this family were running down the stairs, but obviously the train had gone. And yet, when we got to the Lake District, they were there. They, <laughs> they, they clearly driven. <laughs> Weed. Um, but we weren't there for very long. But it was all about because we'd sing on the coach yes. trips. We'd there'd be jokes told, stories. stories. Yes. It was great, and I think for us as well, one of the things you know, my sister wrote a book called uh, one of my many um, called Eagles Who Saw because it was her PhD, um, and it was about how the difference between Caribbean children who survive well in the education system and those who struggle and and the difference was community like mm -hmm. if they had community mm -hmm. around them where they saw that the stereotypes that they were hearing on a daily basis weren't true then it was like a bubble it's like blowing <coughs> the bubble it doesn't mean it didn't hurt it just mean it didn't come as deep because you knew something different so every Saturday what how we grew up and this is a similarity is that every Saturday we saw people who looked like us who were doing 
great things who owned homes and cars and things, you know, and so it, and, you know, was successful and also were pushing education. Mm -hmm. So that made Mm -hmm. a really big difference to our existence and our sense of worth. Yeah. And identity and And identity and pride. Yeah. Because actually what you say is not true because every weekend we see it's not true. Mm. And that was, and that, that thing was quite powerful because then it meant, like if we turned on the television and we saw Trevor McDonald reading the news or Moira Stewart, or we saw Lenny Henry doing Tiswas or whatever the heck it was doing back in the day, there was something that was really aspirational. So even though people sometimes in, in the in schools and in communities who would try to hold back individuals and say they can't achieve, we were then going around and being part of a community who were going, you're going to be brilliant. You're going to succeed. Mm-hmm. You're going to do really well. And that sense of community, even uh, like one quick thing, and then I'll shut up, was uh, in the Caribbean community, we used to have this thing called Pardner. And and basically, Pardner was the what's known technically now as a revolving credit association, all right? So essentially, you'd have a group of six people who would all put in, I don't know, a hundred pounds. Well, the, when they used to get paid in their pack of the little, little brown envelopes, when they used to get paid salaries in the week or what have you, everybody would put in a certain amount. And then that lump sum would then go to, it would rotate around the group. And what that meant is that they bought houses, mm. they bought cars, especially when individuals couldn't get access to mortgages or mm. could they get, you know, equitable rates on, on, on cars and what have you. And, and, it, and, and from that, you got a sense of, right, even if the system doesn't allow you to be able to succeed in this way, there's a way of being able to play the mm. system. And so that for us has been quite integral in the way that we've both developed as well. And was there a particular childhood dream for both of you? <laughs> you would have been looking at Dr. David, but no. <laughs> <That was it. laughs> I always wanted to be married, though. I always did want to be married, and I wanted to have anywhere between two to four children. That was part of my childhood dream. There we go. I never knew what I wanted to do as a career. If I'm being honest, in my heart, I always knew I was destined for greatness. I didn't know where that would show up. Um, I remember mm-hmm. being 14 sitting uh, on the back pew of Leicester Seventh-day Adventist Church and sitting there going, by the time I'm 30, I want to be in management, I want to be married and I want to have had my first child. This is the first understanding of manifesting because I did get to 30. I has, had been promoted to a manager. I was married and I'd had my first child. So that's, that's, that's it for me. Manifest. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I apologise if this is a bit cheesy, but a cheesy Mr. and Mrs. style question. Madeleine, if you could give David, a teenage David, some advice, what would that be? So my, my teenage advice for David would be trust your heart and go for it anyway. Like without reservation, just go for it. You don't have to be what anybody else says you must be. You, you can be what you want to be. That's lovely. And David, how about you? You're smarter than you think, and academics isn't the measurement of your smartness. Oh, I love that. That is wonderful. I'm dying to get on to the um, the sort of like the quick fire round, but before we move on to that, because I think all four of us are passionate about future leaders and helping people in you know particularly in the marketing and advertising industry uh, move forward. Just going back to what it is that you you do and, and how you are helping, if I can focus on the, the Marketing Academy Scholars, because that's, mm. that, that's our kind of mutual connection as well. Yeah. What are the areas that you're trying to focus on to shape those leaders of the future? I'm, I'm going to go back to clarity, confidence and empowerment. I think when people really get stuck. I do a lot of work within the advertising marketing space and that lack of clarity is really impacting people and it impacts how they feel about how they can show up. And if, because they can feel very directionless, which means that you're completely at the mercy of the agency, you know, overworking, you know, trying way too hard. And actually, can you just get clear about what you're trying to achieve, why you're here, what you want to do, because that will serve you no matter where you go and no matter what projects come your way. And my biggie is also about get comfortable with asking the difficult questions, whether that's of your team, whether that's of your clients. And I don't think we ask clients any, we're not, we're not challenging enough with them, which is why we end up wasting a lot of time. I, I see it wasting a lot of time 
creating or doing things that actually aren't what the client really wants because we didn't spend the time to ask the questions so we're just so desperate to please and mm. I'm, I would say you know one of the things for me is don't be so desperate to please be desperate to understand so get that clarity build evidence-based confidence in yourself like you can do this Sit and question yourself isn't going to make the difference. Look at what you've achieved, but also build that in your teams as well and give them the praise that's due. I think that's the stuff that I want to see. And then then together you can be empowered and encourage them to ask questions. That's what I want them to do. Encourage your team because you don't have all the answers, but somebody might have a nugget in your team. But when you do this whole, I need to be the brand, I need to be this, I've got to know it all, <coughs> then actually I think it's a recipe for failure. And as we all know, there is a lot of mediocre in management in the nicest possible way. Um, and that's because people won't do the work on themselves to get where they need to go. So do that work and be ever learning um, and recognise you are a work in progress. That's some great advice. There, there are two bits to mine. The first one is around being courageous. So my kind of signature program is called The Brave Leader. And and one of the reasons why I went with that is that you'll see, or you saw us live, when we ask people questions around how do you feel about telling people no, or how do you feel about overwork, or how do you feel about being in this position, you see people are absolutely afraid of what other people think. And so I'm not dismissing that as a part of the reality, mm. but I want to know how courageous are you to not let that be the determinant around the way that you actually work. And then the second part of what I of my approach is, is that I really think about a generation now who can be a lot more inclusive than our generation and the generation before. And often when people hear me talk about inclusive, they only think about the protected characteristics around gender, around race and ethnicity, around orientation, around ability. But for me, I think it's a lot wider than that. I think it's about how do we make decisions? How do we solve problems? How do we think strategically that impacts every single area? I'm really happy for you that you will go and do a race action plan that, or or you'll go and do a gender plan. But if that's not systemic, and if it's not part of the fabric or the DNA of the organization, mm. you'll be out there fighting an individual battle, but then you get depressed, burnt out and wasted because it's not part of the system. Mm. So how, when you're making purchasing, how, when you're doing customer experience, how, when you're doing your financial allocation and your budgets, how, when you're doing your whole talent process from recruitment to attraction, all the way to hiring up to leadership, how can we make it inclusive to the extent you go, have I thought about the best result for this? And what are my blind spots? That's mm. tough, but it's that the, the, the underlying bit around my coaching and approach is systemic. How do we make sure that this is part of a wider system rather than an individual action. And too often, I think that leadership which focuses just on the one person. And I think leadership should focus on the system that creates those individuals in there. I'd love to hear about anyone in particular who's influenced you along the way or who supported you in your career. I've quite a few. My mentor, Liam, he is a guy called Liam Black. He's tall, six foot three Irish dude. He is so He's so straightforward. Like, he literally... He said, I don't care what anyone else is saying. I'm not going to give you the BS. I'm just going to tell you as it is. And I remember I, when actually, before I first asked him to be a mentor for me, he used to wind me up like something. And I, and I used to think, why is this man winding me up so much? What is it about him? And then I realized it was just that straightforwardness. It was just that real directness. And we connected and he's been mentoring me for a while. So he's been very, very pivotal, especially on this part of my career. But outside of that, there were a lot of the role models were external. I, I liked Richard Branson because of his sense of adventure. I was able to go and work with him for a little while, which was, which was quite interesting, quite challenging. It was just to see his way of the world. I was also a big fan of innovators like Mary Curie. I like the fact that you had an individual who would be like, stick two fingers up to the system. Madam CJ Walker, who created the first kind of right here products for black women. When people, when she was a millionaire, when people, you know, in the black community, you couldn't even really do that stuff. So I had a lot of externals as well as the ones who were, were touching points to me. And obviously my good lady wife as well has been a, an incredible support and an anchor yeah. for me. That's good. Keep telling me about it. Yeah. As a, it's an anchor <laughs> for me to remind me to just kind of like keep my feet on the ground. I don't have many. The first person is my dad because my dad ran his own business, co-ran a business. He was a mechanic and honest, you know, like I never don't think I, it's as I've got older that I realize that, hold on, entrepreneurialism has been in my family all this time, you know, it, 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 like I grew up with that. And so no wonder I couldn't find to settle on 
oh, I do this or do that. It's because actually there was something else that was pulling at me. And my dad was just the best in that respect. And also just, he always used to take us with him. So, and so like his girls, it, there was nothing that we couldn't do. So we would, Sunday mornings, we would be at the, you know, his mechanic shop with him learning about cars. Um, and then on top of that, when he died, uh, uh, on top of our family home, we had four of the houses. And that was because, I mean, we, we didn't keep them, but because mum couldn't cope. But but that was the whole thing of ensuring that each of his daughters had a property. And it's just, it's like, I've always had a love of property and that comes from my dad. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, over the years, there have been different people. Um, in, in recent years, there's a particular woman who I'd never met but I listened to her book. A lot of what she has done has really impacted me. Her name's Catherine Ponder, and the book is called The Divine Laws of Prosperity. And she was the first person I heard say, who's a Christian, that poverty is a sin, and that actually our birthright is to be is is to be wealthy, but not from that whole grabby grabby kind of you know Creflo Dollar way, but the you know, I said it, but, you know, just from the whole thing of mindset, mindset, I'm always banging on about mindset because what we think and what we focus on is what we seem to be able to produce. And I've seen it both ways in my own life. And then there's a guy who I call my mentor, but I think, I think we've sat down to have a mentor sessions twice, but they've been so impactful. It's a guy called Philip Delisle. He used to run, own a a telecoms company. And he was one of the people who said to me, you have got a something, you know, he sat down with this older white guy, you know, sit down. I went to meet him one day at his house and he was just like, you, you have got something. And I was, at the time we were really struggling financially. I said, you know, I want to stop struggling. I'd like to be wealthy. And he said, you are one of the wealthiest people that I know, Madeline McQueen. And I was like, sorry, I beg your pardon. I have any two P in my purse. Um, and it's like he was like, you're one of the wealthy because you need to look at wealth in a different way. You need to look at how rich you are in so many different aspects of your life. That has been life changing. And then I met him a few years just before the pandemic. I we sat down together and again, I mean I I cried for a lot of our session just because as he poured into me and saw me. And I think that makes a really big difference when somebody sees you. I, I There's another person who is a really impactful person in my life. Her name is Remy Ray. She's phenomenal. She's like 15, 16 years, maybe longer, a bit more than that, actually, younger than me. But she's like an old head. And I, I just love spending time with her. Um, she's dyslexic and her brain just works in a way I could never even attempt. She can consume information on a different level. But what I gain from her and vice versa is just pure joy. It's like, oh, my God, your brain is amazing. And I just could listen to it all day. And then obviously, Mr. Mac, he's um, he's actually one of my biggest supporters and that makes a really big difference. And there are other people in my life, some of my friends who are just like, you've got this. And that makes a really big difference. And over the years, the last thing I'll say on this is, I say all the time that sometimes we have friends by default rather than by design. And mm-hmm. um, some of those default friends aren't really your friends. And as Dave, as Dave would say, look who's clapping when something great happens to you. I have a few people and I have less friends now than I ever did before, but they clap and that makes a difference. That is so good. That is so good. Right. We're going to move on to the final part of the podcast now where um, we ask a few personal questions, although I think it probably already has been quite personal. Um, so let's start with what's your idea of a perfect weekend? Mine in the sofa, sitting down not having to get up too early in the morning, just watching crap TV on YouTube. That's Saturday. That Saturday is that. Sunday um, is maybe going out for a meal or definitely having some kind of Sunday dinner together Mm -hmm. currently with, with our, with our kids, Mm -hmm. you know, and anyone else who kind of wants to come along, but yeah, that's Sunday roast. And, and it would have been maybe going for a walk as well, wouldn't it? Very nice. And if we were to have a mooch around in your fridge, what would we Which find? Which one is the question we'd first ask? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then the second question would be, yeah, there's always going to be sal- lots of salad and spinach and, and, and things like that, mushrooms. Uh, you're going to find some cheeses. You're gonna Seven find, different types of cheeses. You're going to find oat cream. Ooh. 
you're going to find um, fruit juice. oat milk, you're going to find fruit juice, you're going to find almond milk. There'll be a little bit of Julie's cow's milk, which she's still trying to get her off. Um, All the milks. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and what else? There'd be some bread in there, wouldn't yeah. there? A little bit of bread, some meats, most probably, yes. Saltfish, always saltfish. Yeah, saltfish. <laughs> okay, this can either be an individual question or a joint one. But if you could both be remembered for one thing, what would it be? Making people smile. It would be making people feel like they could be authentically themselves. I love that. I love that. What's the best compliment you've ever received? You've got sexy lips. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that. I was, I was going to say, it's, it's, Madeline is not owning up to that one. <laughs> I actually really don't know. Um, I think my best compliment is notably around, ah, uh, I know, it is this one, um, maybe I've heard it a number of times, is that you have so much light. Oh, that's nice. So you can shine it on my sex. <laughs> <laughs> so how would your friends describe you? Most probably mad by name, mad by nature. One of my friends says, I'm like a hug and also empowering, I suppose, and supportive and funny. They would say that I'm crazy. <laughs> they would say that I'm very loving. And they would say that I would, the one thing that they all know is I will always put my family first before anything else. Who says that? Don't worry, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> not the sexy lip ones though. <laughs> we have covered so much today and I just want to say a very heartfelt thank you for being here because I know that you are in high demand and it's it's just wonderful to to have this uh, opportunity to talk to you both is there anything that we didn't cover that you really wanted to talk about or any last thoughts from the two of you I don't think there's anything that we think you didn't cover but I, I want to, personally, I want to honour you for asking us to be on this. Mm. Because very often, when we are asked to do things or be part of it, I see it especially as a privilege. I think of the billions of people in this world who don't get the opportunity to have this fun, who don't get the opportunity to do this. And to be able to have the technology and the time and the space to do this, I find it fascinating, so I never take it for granted. So for me, I'm incredibly grateful for it. And I just love doing it. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to have that space to do mm. that with you. And I think I'm going to say thank you for um, inviting both of us. Yes. Because often, like, you know, David is LinkedIn famous. So he wants to say that. <laughs> and so it's really interesting how, how people can sometimes be not recognising. And like you said, you know, we've delivered before together. In fact, I booked it. I wrote the program and then we delivered it together. And then somebody's gone, I'd like to say, thank David and his team for coming. And it's just like, Ooh. bitch. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, so it's really lovely to be also invited and just to be here and have the opportunity to just talk about it. There are no thing, nothing that I would think that we'd needed to say unless it was something that you wanted us to talk about because it's not our podcast it's yours and also just well done for doing it yes. continuing it persisting with it and also for having the insight foresight whatever you want to call it to and the grace to ask us to be here so thank you so much You've been listening to Genuine Humans, brought to you by The Social Element. If you loved what you heard, remember to subscribe or you can find out more at www.thesocialelement.agency.